Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We're delighted you could join us for a fast-paced half hour of conversation with some of Sheboygan County's most exemplary and interesting citizens. <laughs> you got a guest today? <laughs> Starting on my right, Ken Risto, social studies teacher for the Sheboygan Area School District. Um, Cal Potter is uh, joining us, uh, taking time off of his uh, starting to dig in the yard and so forth, former assistant superintendent for libraries at the Department of Public Education and a wide variety of other uh, titles. Uh, Dirk Seilman is joining us today, looking very tan and fit and pretty handsome, I would have to say, in that nice nice jacket and so forth. The town um, chairman, he's got to fit the part. <laughs> town chair, town of uh, Mosul chair, also chairing the uh, county's non-motorized transportation right. grant committee. So he's retired to an extremely busy life. Uh, Dirk is with us because uh, our dear friend Tom Paneski's mom passed away. And uh, Tom is uh, at the funeral, and so we, we send our thoughts and prayers to, to Tom and his family and welcome you. So I mean I have to be the voice of conservatism? It's kind of tough, huh? Oh, I mean I, I think our balance is a little bit <laughs> off here today. <laughs> but in any event, we're all in a rage about the election, so <laughs> why, why not just have everybody screaming off to one side? Well, we're actually talking about some interesting election results in Sheboygan County. Um, the county board gets nine new faces, including just a small round of applause for Peggy Fighter. Um, she beat incumbent Glenn Marcus handily, as a matter of fact, um, out in the town of Sheboygan, town Falls. Of Sheboygan Falls and um, parts of the town of Sheboygan and Sheboygan Falls. Um, Jim Baumgart had an interesting victory. Anybody want to talk about that? Well, he ran a different, a different campaign. His opponent moved into the district, was an incumbent on the county board, but had, had to run against Jim because he moved. Um, but uh, Nelson was able to go door to door. Jim had torn his uh, uh, Achilles tendon, had surgery, and couldn't do door to door. So I guess he did phone calling. So I don't know how that went. I haven't talked to him mm -hmm. since that time. But uh, he tried to make contact with his constituency, and apparently it worked uh, via whatever way he could. Yeah. Well, it's tough to win if you've just moved into the district, which I think in terms of Henry mm -hmm. Nelson, it was like two or three months. Uh, right. And I think Henry had been a good uh, supervisor, and it was a good race. But it's, it's tough to beat an incumbent uh, when you have just moved into the district. And uh, Jim Bumgart listens to his constituents. So yeah. that wasn't a surprising result. Yeah, I think um, I think Henry Nelson's a great guy, mm -hmm. and so is Jim Baumgart. So, I, I think you'd have to work long and hard to defeat Jim Baumgart. Right. You'd have to be Joel Leibham, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and uh, have that kind of name recognition and, and resources and so forth. So, so that'll be interesting. Um, one of my favorite races, um, you know, as I mentioned, I go down to the administration building and call in election results for the League of Women Voters every election, and. Uh, Edith Brugink ran against uh, Adrian Van Dixhorn in the southern part of the county. And um, uh, Mrs. Brugink is elderly, to put it mildly, and uh, she came in two years ago when she ran against him. Uh, Adrian Van Dixhorn almost won, but it was great fun listening to her or watching her watch the, the returns come in, and there, there are four different voting places in that particular district. And, um, uh, and she was. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, election night, she was actually ahead for a while. Hmm. And uh, so she must have her pockets of support. Mr. Van Dixorn must have his pockets of support. But uh, uh, in any event, Peggy Fighter will be, uh, will join Connie Ziegelbauer in the, the distaff side of the county board. So, um, but lots of those races went uncontested. And interestingly, Some of them with no, with no, no candidates. candidates at all, just ratings. Yeah. And um, it, uh, uh, Val Schultz, current county board supervisor who had decided not to run, was reelected uh, on a write-in campaign, and I didn't get those <laughs> those vote totals to know by by how far. But we say goodbye to three wonderful guys: Bill Jens, one of my right. favorite people in the entire universe; uh, Jim Gilligan, who's been on the county board forever, as has Bill Seibold, and so that's many years. Yeah, it's um, the end of an era there. It really is. Yeah. It really is. So, um, a fellow, um, uh, Al um, Bosman from uh, Town of Lima Town Board uh, won his race to succeed Bill. And of course, Bill is still the, the chair of the Town of Lima. Right. So, city races. 
not quite so interesting. Only one contested aldermanic race. Um, I thought Ed Sirk and Dan Hill had a pretty spirited race. Were you said, and Sirk won big. Anybody surprised by that? I think he had name recognition because of his previous stint as the, with the city. So I think that wasn't. So he had some type of visibility amongst uh, the constituency out there. Yeah, I I um, I wonder. Uh, I think it's hard. See if you agree with me. When you're a staff person, uh, and you work for an entity, and then and it happens from time to time, you then become an elected member of the governing body of that entity, and those are two really, really different jobs. And I think sometimes those, I think Ed's challenge is going to be to keep that separate. You know, he's not the director of HR; he can't be second guessing. Right or micromanaging the HR department or you know the salary and grievance committee. I don't know, I think that's, that's kind of tough. So. Does anybody know what the motivation for him to run was? Mm -hmm. I, I was just wasn't able to follow the race and there, I don't think there was a whole lot of yeah. you know, public community mm -hmm. forums where the two of them could really talk a little bit about I don't remember hearing anything on WHBL any ma either. Right, any major issues. Uh, <clears throat> I, don't, yeah. I don't think there were. I mean, I think just two candidates, both of them pretty credible, put their names up. Uh, mm -hmm. Hill has not lived in the district real long, is my understanding, and works outside of the area. And Surik, uh, but I think they both worked. I, I believe they were both out mm -hmm. there talking to people. And yeah. you know, that's mm -hmm. what democracy is all about. Yeah. And we wish you had more of it. Yeah. yeah. I am. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, Ed was just one of those retired guys who all of a sudden needed something to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You two managed to stay busy enough, so I hope to attend. I haven't run for local politics. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> <not> yet. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Now you're you going to work. You could announce today, Cal. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll run for school board after I retire. There yeah. you go. Yeah. See if maybe I can manage the, the transition that you were saying, just talking about. But or that'd be somebody's worst nightmare. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Reap whatever revenge you wanted on the uh, well, on the powers that be. <laughs> Who I'm knows? Just, it, I'm just wondering what what Ed will bring to the table, um, and what perspectives he'll bring. It'll be interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. He really will. Yeah, so. it's my sense he's not necessarily a friend of the mayor, but who is these days, huh? <laughs> so people are uh, running already. <laughs> well, I think um, I, I was a little surprised at the mayor's early announcement. Um, Dirk, what do you think? I don't was think that he a... really, I mean, it's one of these things, and it's happened a couple of times, where somebody asks him the question, are you running? He says yes, and all of a sudden it's like it's this major announcement. And I think in the mayor's mind, of course I'm running. I've said it before, I'll say it again, and I'll have a specific announcement somewhere down the line. And it must be a slow news day or something, because all of a sudden it's a, it's a headline uh, in the paper. If anybody is surprised that Mayor Perez is running again, uh, I sure don't know him. They and he's already been... announced he's going to do two terms. Yeah. And he yeah. said he's going to be moving on after that. So, you know, yeah, he's been really upfront about yeah. that. Anytime anybody, you know, whether it be Dave and Carol on WKLH or whoever it might be, yeah. he sort of asks the question, he answers it. You're right. Yeah. He's been on WKLH? Well, they did that uh, thing at Blue uh, Harbor. Blue Harbor. Uh, it, was, it, was, right. it was the That's same right. thing. And they kind of just, yeah, they just kind of asked him out of the clue blue sky when they were doing the Bratwurst Day thing, you know, well, what do you think? And he said, yeah. Planning on running, he just made it, did it as a side, and I remember that making all that sorts of... That was a front page headline as yeah, well. splash so. as well. Well, let's yeah. see. He only has to do that about 10 more times. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, and Bill Wangaman has thrown his hat in the ring. I was surprised that the Sheboygan Press printed his column uh, in the Sunday uh, paper. I mean, isn't there a general rule of thumb that when you're running for office, you don't get that... You don't get it, to be on Dirk Seilman's uh, radio show and... It, it has always been a tradition that if you're running opposed, uh, that you do not participate on a radio show or you do not have regular columns in the paper. Now, with Jim Bumgard, he ran his column all the time. On the other hand, that wasn't really political stuff, but neither is Wungaman, and that's probably yeah. the differentiation that they're making uh, if it were somebody talking about politics. But it is, to some extent, you could argue it's an unfair advantage because his name is in there, and, and if he writes a good column, people say, oh, that was interesting, and that's a plus for him. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that no one really at the press has sat down and, 
at least said, this is our policy, because it seems to be pretty fluid right now. Yeah, yeah I don't. I, I, well, from my experience, I used to put out columns, and I used to do television shows such as this. And it usually was around the time of announcement or nomination paper circulation right. commencing. June 1st, something of like that, for a November election. So, Or maybe sometimes even the formal filing. Yeah. You can say yeah. you're running all you want, but so, until you actually so file, you're not So I think maybe the press official. is just maybe saying that's it's so doing. doggone far in advance yeah. that we just can't, in justification, cut out one of our columnists. Right. We need all the good copy we can get. <laughs> <laughs> and his columns are interesting. Sure, yeah. sure. I think he's a good city historian. Yeah. I really Better do. Better than a lot of the fluff that's put in his papers. Yeah. Um, yep. It'll be interesting. We'll talk in our state segment about uh, Shirley Abrahamson throwing her hat in the ring a full, I mean, the day after the Supreme Court race, which I thought was interesting. We'll get to that. But I think um, uh, the rumors are still out there that Terry Van Akron will run, that uh, I've heard Jim Gisha will run. I've heard that Mark Ryan. Hanna will run. Certainly Bob Ryan has. I got a little interesting little flyer from Bob um, in the mail that he must have sent to his constituents that was unusual, had some unusual text in it, and um, but led me to think that that might be his way of staying in the public eye. Not, I don't know, one way or the other. Um, what he did say was, I'm sending this even though I'm unopposed because this is Sheboygan politics and anything can happen. And I thought, well, that's odd, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect, the groundswell of write-ins uh, to be organized uh, without him knowing about it? That, such that at the end we count all the write-ins and he's out? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> and Joe DiCecco is elected, uh, is elected <laughs> alder person? I don't know, but I, okay. thought, uh, I thought that was strange. So <laughs> I'm interested in your opinions as to whether a primary hurts or helps Mayor Perez come the real campaign season. I mean, the bottom line is going to have a primary. I think it's pretty clear that there will be at least three people running. And to some extent, it, it allowed, it's, it's like hiring somebody to do a poll for you. You know where you stand, and you kind of have a sense of what the issues are. And whoever comes in second uh, can make the determination, do, whoever came in third, do I try to ally with that person? Do I change my issues? Do, do my issues seem to be working? Um, so I, I don't think it hurts Mayor Perez. It depends, I think, a lot on how the tenure of the campaign goes. If you have five opponents and they're all beating the living daylights out of you, I mean, there's not much left of the, of the pork roast <laughs> after they're done beating them up after seven months. But if they tend to uh, divide up the vote and then when push comes to shove at the end when there are only two candidates and the other ones are not allied with the remaining challenger, then it's to somewhat you know, the, the incumbent comes out of the race because the opposition is divided so much. So, you know, there are good, there are, I think, two ways of looking at it. There's positive and there's negative. I think it happened, I think the real X factor is going to be Van Akron because if Van Akron announces, I don't know, does he have to vacate his assembly no. seat? No. no. Okay, so that's, that's the important thing is if that assembly seat was open, I think some people who might think about running for mayor would, lo would rather go to Madison. Mm -hmm. But if he's got a free ride and he can run for mayor and if he wins, fine. If he loses, he doesn't lose anything as far as his position in Madison. Then that makes things very different. But how and can I, you... I don't know how these guys separate themselves. When you, if you go through the list of the folks who are challenging... I don't know how they separate themselves out. So I th would guess that it's going to be pretty much, let's all talk about why we don't want Juan Perez mayor. And then once we find out how the dust settles, then we'll figure out from there where we, we go to separate themselves. But I would think that everybody who's unhappy with, with the current mayor is going to divide their votes out over those two or three, or depending on how many candidates you got. And I, so I think he's going to survive He's going to at least survive uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the general. Sure. And then you go from there. But you're yeah. right. I think you'll get a sense of where your strength yeah. and where your support is. And it's, it's not be easy being a mayor these days. Oh, yeah. Uh, you've got a slowing economy. You, in the case of Sheboygan, you're landlocked, so your, your tax base really isn't growing. When you look at the demographics, the more affluent people end up moving outside the city. And so you end up having a disproportionate number of people who need more social services, who need, uh, you end up really start going toward a black hole. And 
And the answer, I think, is in, in any area, not just Sheboygan, is that there's got to be greater regional or county city cooperation because, you know, I sit out in the town of Mosul, but I recognize that you can't just let the city of Sheboygan keep going downhill. Uh, we're all in this together, and I think uh, that's, that's what uh, the county has to work on and the city has to work on it as well. Yeah. Although the city, I think, has done really pretty well over the last three years, I mean, just in terms of the tax rate, and uh, certainly there's been a whole lot of building and some commercial development and, and so forth. But my question is, how does Terry Van Akron run for the assembly in November and then circulate nomination papers starting December 1st for mayor? I think his constituency would feel, if, if nothing else, puzzled, and maybe something a little more dramatic than that. I, I don't know, because I think Terry Van Akron would be a formidable candidate. His like last name is such a great name, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, um, I, just, uh, I, I just don't know how all of that would play out. And it depends what kind of opposition he has. I mean, in line with what you're saying is he may, if, if he feels that he is being pushed pretty hard, have to make that statement. If I am elected or reelected uh, mm -hmm. to the assembly, I will not run for mayor if whoever his opponent is makes that a, an issue in the campaign. Right, right. And the Republicans, I don't know who, who they would find. I mean, Terry's seat is feeling safer and safer, yeah. um, I think. I mean, I'm, well, I'm not sure who the, I mean, the Republicans would put forward. When Zempel ran against him as a first, as a newcomer, he was a pretty articulate young man, compared to Terry, he's young anyway, uh, and that was a reasonably competitive race. Mm -hmm. It'll be, yeah, it would be interesting to see who the Republicans come up with mm -hmm. to run against him. Certainly whoever does will have a substantial amount of money behind them. That much is clear. Yeah. Wisconsin Association of Manufacturers and lots of other folks will be throwing a lot of money um, toward whatever Republican. Because I think they think that this uh, city, that seat, even though it's city more than it's county, is is starting to move away from the Democratic Party. I, a I would bit. characterize that as a very safe Democratic seat. You think so? And you know, I think Liveham was really an anomaly. Was very Nobody much an anomaly. Nobody knew he was a Republican. Well, he ran more as an older person, the, right. the, the person who would. And, and he was on TV all the time, and people knew him, and he was this kind of young, vigorous guy, and he out-campaigned uh, uh, his, his opposition. And I think that was an anomaly. And I think yeah. now Terry is in, and, and I think it's a real question whether he even will have opposition uh, come fall. And I'm embarrassed. I don't remember. Who was the opposition two years ago? Did he have opposition? I don't think. No, he did no. not. Wait. Yeah. I don't think he did. Oh, yeah. Was, was that Jose? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah. That's right. Remember that's right. The, yes. Uh, Spanish yeah. language ad or whatever he ran that <laughs> yeah. was so controversial. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Or the mimicking of a Spanish lady, I think it was. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, that that seat, was pretty classy. Uh, you know, one of the things that will benefit uh, certain Democrats is that the major ma margin of majority in the assembly is, I think, like three seats today. It wasn't. It was much greater. Right. The last election uh, narrowed it, and if this economy continues to go down the tubes and all manner of dissatisfaction continues with the Bush administration, I think Democrats should do fairly well. So I think there are a number of Republican incumbents that need to be defended, plus there's going to say if they're going to have any chance of more influence in Madison, they've got to up that majority for more than three seats. So I think they are going to pick and choose seats, I and agree. I don't know that this is the one they're going to dump agree. all their money in. Yeah, and they, I think they there lost, were, what, four or five or six in the last right. election. Yes. It's going to be a Democrat, probably going to be a Democratic year nationally. The challenge with if, if the economy keeps souring, you know, some of it may in Wisconsin come against the Doyle administration. Mm. Um, so that may play. But if, if you're a Republican, you're going to be focusing on holding your seats and, and trying to regain those that you lost two years which ago. Which were marginal seats anyway. Which were marginal as opposed to going after somebody who's a pretty entrenched incumbent. Right. I think the Republicans would have to come up with a really super candidate before, mm. before they would um, put any money into mm. this, this particular race. Well, speaking of the mayor's race, you know that a number of people are uh, interested in running because the council okayed raises for the mayor through uh, 2012. Uh, the, um, it's 3% uh, a year beginning in May of 2009 on a vote of 9 to 6. Um, 
The ones who voted to approve the mayor's raise were Boren, Verhasselt, Montemayor, Meyer, Manny, Clyunas, Hanna, Bauk, and Gisha. Voting against were Heidemann, your older person, Jean Kittleson, Eric Rindfleisch, uh, Ryan, Vanderweel, and Wangaman. And um, so it's, um, it's interesting to see, to see how that'll play out. By two, 2012, the salary will be $78,631, which is, is a decent living, I would have to say. And uh, do you think that uh, we had this go through because we've got any number of older people who are thinking of running? <laughs> Possible. <laughs> I mean, that's so cynical. Well, it cut yeah. both ways, though. I mean, some of the names we mentioned earlier voted no. I mean, mm -hmm. Hannah's Wangaman uh, voted no. Some voted yes. No, Hannah yes. voted yes. Oh, Hannah voted yes. And I'm so sorry. did Gisha. Okay, mm -hmm. and Manny was a uh, lame duck, so mm -hmm. he can vote his conscience. Mm -hmm. I mean, seventy thousand dollars is what we pay for an assistant principal in the Sheboygan Area School District. Well, maybe some would argue that's too much money. Bragging, complaining, or apologizing. Well, I'm just simply saying, when running a city, you know, right. you're talking about the challenges a, a, a mayor faces and the kinds of budgets and the challenges of a city even the size of Sheboygan. And a flat seventy thousand, yeah, you know, seventy thousand dollars. I mean is for a lot of families, I understand, in Sheboygan, a, a very nice, uh, comfortable sum of money, but given the responsibilities, it's not outlandish, and 3% a year means that you're basically holding for inflation right about now, so it's not terribly out of line by any stretch of the imagination. Well, and, and I think it's people, reasonable. Oh, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it is in any way. No. I, I think it's reasonable. People have talked about a city administrator or a city manager. Mm. That, you're not going to get that person for less than $110,000, $120,000. Right. Uh, at least. At least. Maybe yeah. more. Yeah. Um, and... Mayor Perez, I think, has been a good manager, and he takes this seriously, and he's trying to uh, change some of the culture uh, within City Hall, and for that reason, he gets flack. And, uh, uh, and I think a prime example was the earlier vote on the uh, salary increase, when it was seven to seven. Mm -hmm. And basically what the mayor did is he recused himself. He said, basically, I am voting on what very well could be my own salary. I'm just going to wait till the two missing older people are back. And he got flack for that and said, well, you're not showing leadership and all this sort of thing. Well, the I press thought, editorial was amazing. Right. I mean, I thought it was just the right thing for him to do. Sure. He said, basically, I want council to decide what the mayor's salary is. The mayor shouldn't decide what his salary, salary is. is. Can right. you imagine if he had voted the other way with the, the press editorial? The same would have been? people <laughs> would have been screaming that he was, exactly. you know, conflict of interest. No, I thought the mayor showed real judgment there. I mean, right. especially when you have absent uh, alder right. uh, folks not in the chamber. You know, it's not a burning issue. It's not a pressing yeah. issue. The city is going to keep on running. Uh, you wait for the vote. I thought, yeah, I thought the press editorial was bizarre, quite honestly. I thought the mayor's letter in response to it was awfully good. Um, uh, you know, basically just saying, uh, this isn't my job. It's not my job to set my salary. It's right. the council's job, right. and they need to take the responsibility and the ownership for making those decisions. And uh, it was a it was a pretty articulate letter, um, acknowledging and as his other letter has that uh, letter some time ago is that he he does tend to attract a lot of controversy. <laughs> it's a gentle way of putting it, but uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was I thought it was just a strange editorial I would have mm -hmm. to say because um, it seemed to me to be perfectly appropriate and yeah. yeah I think he used good judgment we had the same thing in the, in the legislative level for years the, the legislature would vote on their own salary and we went I remember oh my god it must have been three sessions without any increase because nobody had the guts enough to raise their own salary but yet you knew that you're getting further and further behind and right. somewhere down the line you need to make a, a jump to try to get respectable again. So what we did is we changed the, the, the way and there was a committee made up of people from the department administration as well as the leadership in the legislature would set these salaries and then we would take it as part of the total non-union package. And that was the, in that way you were doing something that you could fall back on and say, here, reasonable people looked at what ought to be the salary level and will vote on it after they have made a, a decision. And I think the mayor is saying the same thing. Well, let somebody else look at the situation, come up with a reasonable amount, and then I'll, uh, I'll live with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought it was a very good move on his part. Interesting other elections, just talking about primaries, uh, the city of Plymouth election for mayor was very interesting to me, and they have a fairly contentious body there and have had for a number of years. Uh, Don Pullman, 
who barely survived the primary, won convincingly yeah. in the general election. So that was that was really nice to see. I think he's a I think he's a pretty decent guy, um, and uh, so. You never know in primaries. Sometimes yeah. it's a real signal as to what's going on, and, and other and times it just gets people all riled quite up. Quite often, if, if there's a primary, the people that are opposing the incumbent are the ones that are all fired up, and a lot of the incumbent's supporters say, oh, he's, he or she, uh, they're going to they're gonna make it through the primary, and I'll work in the general election. And once in a while, there's a surprise. But I think that might have happened in, in uh, Plymouth, where more of Pullman's supporters came out in the general election, whereas the, the primary opponents were kind of energized more because they were fighting for that second position mm -hmm. and they got a little bit better turnout among their supporters. Yeah. And um, as, we, uh, as we're coming to an end, uh, end of an era in the Sheboygan Area School District Board of Education, Maeve Quinn is finishing her ninth year on the Sheboygan Area School Board. Dirk and I had previously served with mm -hmm. distinction, I might add. <laughs> Self-proclaimed distinction. <laughs> but if I we didn't say so ourselves. <laughs> but I didn't vote on a pay raise. <laughs> so, and and uh, Maeve uh, is just a person of integrity and principle and, yeah. and uh, served the school district well over the, four, over the nine years and will be missed. Yeah. Uh, and, and our best wishes to Maeve as she moves on to other pursuits. And it was great because Jenny Poth Pothist, I think is, is how you pronounce her name, uh, came in first. Uh, this is the person who will essentially be replacing Maeve, and uh, she beat uh, Larry Samet and uh, uh, and uh, David Gallinetti, not by much, but... Uh, Was uh, Gallinetti the third in yeah, those three? Yeah, I think there were about 10 votes apiece, but <laughs> considering that Jenny was brand new, um, I, thought that, was, uh, I yeah. thought that was an interesting way that it played out. But uh, so I, th you know, Plymouth area has uh, some new school board members who won convincingly and some fairly contested races, Mark uh, Ryan and Jerry Prawl. So overall, I think the, the landscape got mixed up at least a little bit. I wonder if there'll be more contests for older people next, uh, next well, season. What's interesting is last year, I think seven of the eight elections were contested. And here it was, as we just said, one out of the eight. So it, it goes in cycles. It really does. So, well, in any event, we've uh, dissected the election uh, locally and uh, some new faces and new challenges. and. Uh, uh, thank you all for joining us. Dirk, thanks for, for joining. I think we did a fairly balanced job. Fair and balanced, isn't Dirk that? Dirk is a very balanced person. There we go. There we go. The rest of us are slightly As opposed unhinged. opposed to imbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time.